It's our second to last show, and today a very special topic, how to help the people you love and the people you may live with deal with anxiety. All that and more is coming up. We're getting through this together. All right, welcome to the show, everybody. Let's get right to it. I hope you're doing well. You know, society is starting to reopen all around us. That's a good thing, but uh, if you've got anxiety, maybe especially health anxiety, you know, <laughs> your, your mental health just doesn't open like that. And maybe even this reopening is triggering some new anxiety in you, and that's totally to be expected. I wanna encourage you to keep fighting against it. Uh, don't stop, it's a battle. If necessary, even go back to the previous videos and review some strategies. We've talked about physical things you can do, mental things you can do, social things you can do. And so go back and wage this war on anxiety. I want you to as well know that there's lots of people who understand what you're going through. And today's video is for those people who want to understand what you're going through. And so we've got some great tips for how to help the people in your life who may struggle with anxiety. Uh, some things to do, some things not to do. And I've got my favorite interview guest ever. Can't wait for you to meet her. Let's go inside and say hi. Well, hey Jess, what are you up to? It's pizza night at the Witt household. Ooh, you are putting dates on yours? <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's see what we've got for me. Five kinds of cheeses and counting. Let's get some gorgonzola on there. Yes, Hi. look at this. So thanks for uh, being on the show today. And by the way, you're the interview guest today. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're talking about uh, living with someone with anxiety. So uh, you're the expert, you live with me. Oh, but you live with me. Oh, we're both experts. This will be an interesting <laughs> conversation. Anyway, uh, this meal, it's, it's no accident that we're actually eating this fun meal together and I'm gonna tell you why at the end of our interview. But uh, first, let's eat, say, okay, okay shall we? Yeah, all right. All right, Jess, awesome, awesome dinner. Ah, oh, very significant dinner too. We're gonna to tell you why, again, in just a little bit. But right now, you know what, you're our expert guest because our topic is living with somebody with anxiety. Uh, tell us, what's it like to live with someone with anxiety? Well, <laughs> yeah, you, don't have to, you don't have to answer if you don't. Okay. No, I mean, I've had anxiety too, so, I mean, what is it like? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, as many people know, it's, uh, it's actually not that easy, right? I mean, uh, anytime you bring any two lives together, it's not uh, easy. But uh, the people in your life, um, the statistic out this week said one out of three people now mm in COVID time have significant symptoms of anxiety or depression. Mm -hmm. That means statistically speaking, it's probably you, and if it's not you, it's probably your wife, and if it's not your wife, it's your child or uh, parent. Um, someone around you is struggling if it's not you, and it's really important to think about how to best help them. We will wanna help them, but sometimes it almost seems like the things we do can be counterproductive, right? And it can be frustrating not knowing how to help people. So I just wanna congratulate everybody on watching for taking step one without even knowing it. Step one is educate yourself. And if you know um, a little bit about anxiety and a little bit about depression, then you'll have this kind of um, picture of what someone may be going through. And you uh, can rewind a few episodes and hear my story and just kind of get an example of what it's like to be someone who suffers with these uh, issues. Yeah. So how do you know if someone is anxious or depressed? Like what are some of the signs? Great question. I think we all, uh, you know, there's gonna be a link in the video description below where you can take a uh, online questionnaire mm -hmm. to see if you're anxious or depressed. And you can use those same questions to kind of evaluate others. But, but really it's, it's kind of simple if you ask me. Uh, we all know what it's like to be afraid. We all know what it's like to be a little anxious, uh, even though it probably doesn't impact our ability to go on living life. 
significantly. We all know what it's like to be sad sometimes. Um, if you've never been sad, then something's probably wrong with you, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. uh, the, so we all exist on a continuum. Something I learned while studying this in, in college and grad school, like mental illness is not a light switch, it's more like a dimmer. And we all exist on that continuum somewhere. Um, there's a certain point on that dimmer where the symptoms rise to a level that it impacts your ability to live well. It impacts your ability to go to work every day. It impacts your ability to have a good marriage. It impacts your ability to enjoy your hobbies and your life. And when it significant, significantly impacts your ability to live, that's when uh, is a red flag that you may need professional help. Mm -hmm. And that's the red flag that you should be looking for in other people's lives. They may hide well. I mean, people cope with anxiety really, really well to where you would never know half the people have anxiety have anxiety. But if you're their good friend, if you're their dad or spouse, you're going to know and you're going to want to take some action. Hmm. So what what is the action like? Do you go to them directly or, you know, I, I feel like people with anxiety or depression can feel shame or mm. just, you know, may not be ready to talk about stuff. So how can you help them? Yeah, well, I think the very first thing you got to do is evaluate if there's a crisis. So if they're in the middle of something that could be harmful to them or if they could be a harm to someone else, you have to discern that and then you have to take immediate action. Call 911, the suicide prevention hotline. Uh, take steps there. Otherwise, I mean, really, your first step is um, to just break the ice. Mm. And so you might say something as simple as this. Let me give you some words to try. I noticed you've been acting differently lately and wonder how you're doing. Or I want to check in and see how you are. You've seemed pretty down. So these simple icebreakers can kind of, uh, you know, just open a discussion. And let me tell you, as someone who has had anxiety and uh, different shades of depression, um, we, we don't mind being asked. In fact, we appreciate that people care. And especially if someone has earned that right to be, like, you have to earn your way into this. You can't just go up to a stranger and say, hey, you look depressed. <laughs> you're like, That's kind of rude. <laughs> but, but the people in your life that you're close to, you can say a statement like that and you're off to having a, a good conversation that they really won't mind for the most part. Most people really appreciate that you care. Hmm. That's good. So you want to keep that conversation going by asking some good questions. And I think, you know, everybody's different. So even though you've done step one and you've learned a little bit about anxiety and depression in general, you don't want to just throw that on the person and just assume like, I know what your problem is, and I know what you're thinking, and I know your, how to help you out of it. You want to uh, be a student of that person's experience, and you want to allow them the privilege of sharing it with you. And um, you want to ask good questions to help find and brainstorm together You know how you can be of help in your relationship with them. Yeah, it sounds like when you ask the questions, you're you're kind of telling us to, that we have to be good listeners mm -hmm. to what they're telling us. Yeah, listening is the most important thing. So if you don't remember anything else from this video today, just remember that the best thing you can do to help somebody who's struggling is just to listen well. And um, a big part of that is letting them know that you're listening well, because you could listen well, but come across as if you're disinterested. So you want to intentionally repeat back some of the things they've said. So it sounds like you are feeling down because of the situation at work or, man, it seems to me like uh, you have been feeling this way for quite a while. Um, anyway, it, in doing so, it, it verifies for them that you are actually understanding them and it gives them the opportunity to correct if you've misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So reflective listening, man, it's a really important skill. Make sure people know they're uh, being heard really well. And maybe the other half of good listening is avoiding its opposite, which is talking. So there's a t there might be a temptation to talk too much. And anytime you're talking, you can't listen. And especially the kind of talking we want to avoid is fixing. Mm. 
So it's really, really tempting to come in and say things like, oh yeah, I know exactly what you're feeling. I felt scared yesterday and I took this supplement and I'm better now. And it's very dismissive and it's, it's a one size fits all thing that may not work for them. Um, so fixing is bad, a, a bad idea. You're not a therapist, so don't act like one. Mm. Yeah, so since we're not a therapist, Look at her repeating my, she's doing <laughs> active listening. This is great. Um, how do we, you know, help the person reach out to a therapist if that's what they need or? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's really important, like you say, to just remember you're, you're not a therapist. And even if you are, maybe there's a, the odd person watching this. We do have some therapists who watch this. You're a therapist. Still don't do therapy with your loved ones because it's a dual relationship. So... Even I have degrees in this, but I'm not going to do counseling on Jess because it's just not, you, you can't do it. Gosh, wh how do I say that right? You, you just can't do therapy on your loved ones, but especially if you're not qualified. So if you're not qualified, you're going to end up, um, you know, ex trying to expose someone to what they're afraid of. That is a real thing you do in therapy. But if you do it the wrong way, it can actually set them back. Um, you may end up treating them incorrectly. Um, you'll remember from my story that I was diagnosed with OCD, not generalized anxiety disorder, not a specific phobia of doctors or, you know, I had a very specific thing that has a very specific brain chemistry and, and process that has to be unwound a certain specific way. Mm -hmm. So if someone was not a good listener and was a fixer and was trying to do amateur therapy on me, they would have said something along the lines of, oh, it sounds like you are just anxious a lot and why don't you just do this and you'll be better. That could be very harmful to someone, so don't, don't do that. Uh, if they do need therapy, like you say, then you can be a powerful ally for helping normalize that and say, hey, it's okay, it's nothing to be ashamed about, you know? And, if you're feeling nervous about it, I'd be glad to drive you to the first appointment and sit in the lobby. Um, I'll even help you research what options are out there because sometimes people with anxiety or depression, it's a, it's a big task to undertake. Mm -hmm. So doing some of the legwork for them to set up an appointment and drive them there, that's um, you know something that you could really do that would make a lasting impact on them. Mm, that's great. Are there other um, things that you can do for them besides just helping them go to therapy like in their everyday life or? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the things we've been talking about in these videos, mm, you know, mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, was it last week we talked about social connection? That's mm -hmm. important. So you just being their friend and doing things together is important. Mm -hmm. uh, exercising together, video number one, mm -hmm. important. So put those together and just make plans. Mm -hmm. Call them up or text them or whatever and say, hey, uh, you know, let's make some plans this week. Let's go out walking or running. And you're killing two or three birds with one stone right there, just going walking together. Mm -hmm. um, plan a game night. It takes all the social anxiety away. You don't have to worry about what to talk about. You got the games there. Um, you know, do a hobby with them, whatever their hobby is. Get them engaged in their hobbies so they remember that they're a person, not just a disorder. Mm -hmm. So make plans with them, I think is really important. Yeah, that's good. And I would add to that, you know, be positive around them as much as you can in your interactions. These are um, disorders that make people just notice everything negative and they need a lot of positive reinforcement. So uh, even if they're doing something that's not productive for their, their mental health, don't like punish them or like call them out, but instead just look for what they're doing right and what's gonna help them mm -hmm. and say, man, that is awesome that you're doing that. You are, you are doing so well and I'm so proud of you and keep up the good work. And that kind of positive reinforcement is gonna go a long way. Yeah, that's good. And speaking about positive, you know, I think um, just love, you know, uh, acceptance is really important too. Um, I'll just put that word on screen, just love, <laughs> you know. Uh, in the psycho psychology world, we call it unconditional positive regard. There's a whole school of psychology built around this. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the thought that there's something powerful about revealing yourself to someone else and being accepted. And this is my own picture. Uh, I picture it like a launch pad. We just had a SpaceX launch, right? It takes a very firm thing to, to launch off of. Well, this unconditional positive regard, this unconditional love, this covenant love, this steadfast love, 
uh, biblical love, you know, so to speak, love that never changes, never goes away. Uh, that is a bedrock foundation that someone can launch off of. They can feel the courage to launch into healing and therapy and growing because they know they've got that love there. Mm -hmm. So love, unconditional positive regard. It's important mm -hmm. in everything. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about one more thing, and that is spirituality. Mm -hmm. That's going to be next week's video, by the way. But, uh, you know, spirituality is part of life. And if you're trying to help someone through depression, it's important to take care of that part of their life as well. So invite them to church, share how you pray, uh, pray for them if, if they're open to that, uh, share scripture with them if they're open to that, always respectfully, but yeah. uh, sharing what's important to you. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems like a lot of this requires like personal relationship and just engagement and like you're saying a listening with love and um yeah yeah um, it's it could be a lot of work it's difficult <laughs> yeah it's difficult it requires patience mm. it requires gentleness it requires knowing that uh recovery is lifelong mm. um for many um it's it's something they have to battle forever and so uh, the battle gets easier over time, but uh, it's, it's always there. And so you should expect two steps forward, one step back. You should expect a roller coaster of ups and downs. You should expect the person to cancel plans on you once in a while just because the anxiety is too bad. And you have to like unconditionally love them through that and say, I understand, it's okay. You know, it's okay to feel that way, it's totally fine. Um, we'll try again next week. There's something really powerful about that, you know? So expect the ups and downs and expect that it's gonna be hard for you as the caregiver too. Um, this is gonna impact your life. And you know, if you're watching this video and you live with someone who's severely, you know, depends on where they are on the dimmer switch analogy, it depends on how far up they are on that scale, but it can severely impact your life and your mental health as, as the partner. Um, you know, they're going to have less energy to do chores around the house, to pay bills, to maybe hold down a job that will give you the money to pay those bills. Uh, it's going to affect their ability to be, uh, you know, part of a romantic relationship, fully engaged like you would want them to be. And so there's a temptation to take some of this personally or to take offense to it. Um, and man, that's hard to love your way through that, but you have to do that as well. The good news is, you know, there's support for you as well. And the caregiver uh, has to really take care of their own health or else they won't have anything to offer the person they're trying to take care of. So maintain your own social support. Maintain your own interests and hobbies to keep yourself afloat. Maintain your own exercise. Maintain your own, all the things we talk about for mental health, you gotta do for yourself too. It's like that uh, airline thing, you know, put on your own oxygen mm -hmm. mask before you help someone else. You gotta okay, keep yourself he healthy enough to help someone else, you know? And, um, and, and sometimes that involves even reaching out for therapy yourself. Um, maybe couples therapy, maybe family therapy, maybe group therapy is part of your journey uh, and just untangling the whole dynamic. Mm -hmm. And that's to say nothing of your uh, worth or strength or faith or anything else. Um, anyway, that is a very quick, maybe it wasn't quick enough. There's a lot that could be said, but that was an overview mm -hmm. of some things that are helpful and not helpful with helping a loved one. To sum up, helpful listening and good questions, not helpful making assumptions and trying to fix dismissively. Maybe even arguing, trying to argue someone out of this. Maybe I didn't say that clearly enough earlier, but you can't argue someone out of depression or anxiety. You can't use logic. You can't, you just can't do that. And that's really hard for logical people. <laughs> <laughs> so um, loving and listening, that's the, that's the way, the long, hard way. So, any thoughts about living with me that you want to share? No, I'm just loving and listening over here. <laughs> I'm loving and listening. <laughs> Same as always. Well, um, we did promise there, there's this cliffhanger that everybody's just dying to know what was the pizza about. So like I say, 
There's nothing random in these shows. Nothing. Every detail planned for you, the viewer. <laughs> and, yeah, except my words. There might yes. be random. Anyway, uh, yeah, the pizza uh, in this episode, it, it comes from something Jess did for me uh, a few months ago. So I, uh, at the whole start of this COVID outbreak, came down with a fever and a sore throat and some symptoms I've really never had before. I have seasonal allergies and stuff, but this is atypical and I um, couldn't get a COVID test, so I don't know what it was, but uh, it literally had me beside myself. Uh, I guess literally I can't physically be beside myself, but mentally I felt like I had no idea what to do with myself. And uh, taking walks around the block was all I could do to keep my sanity. And uh, like you hear some COVID patients say, but also a lot of anxiety uh, sufferers, the nights are the worst. And there was a week where I didn't sleep a, a few hours the entire week, you know. It was terrible. And I would go from our bed for an hour and toss and turn, and I wouldn't want to keep her up. So I'd go to the couch and I'd toss and turn for an hour, and then I'd go back and I'd switch places eight times a night and just wait for the sun to come up. And it would repeat the next night and repeat the next night. Uh, and it got to the point where I just f almost feared the bedroom. Like I was d developing a phobia of this, this time of day that I hated and th these two places that I hated. And um, anyway, Jess uh, found a way out for me in applying all that we've talked about. She didn't do a one size fits all thing she was very creative and she planned a date night for us. It was camping themed, even mm -hmm. though it was in here because I don't really like camping. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so we brought out an air mattress and uh, George Foreman grill and um, we had the whole pizza bar out. We made pizzas. We watched uh, a movie on the air mattress and uh, had s'mores. And that was the first night I slept in like a week. Uh, and it was the beginning of bringing it all back together for me. So, um, yeah, I don't know what to say other than love looks different in everybody's uh, situation. And it requires understanding and listening well, and it requires a commitment to do whatever. And that was whatever, that was really, that was really clutch for me. So the little and big things you can do to take care of each other um, it really means more than you know to the people in your lives. And uh, as we close this video, um, I don't know what kind of life these will have online and how long this video will last, but the, as we were recording this, the country's going crazy and we're at each other's throats and um, man, it's, it's hard to watch. And we've talked a lot about love today and a lot about listening today. And it just occurs to me like, don't we all need that in every aspect of life? So a little less talking, a little less teaching, a little more listening and a little more learning. So let's approach everybody in life that way. And uh, anyway, We'll be back next week to wrap this all up with our grand finale. Thanks for being along for this journey and uh, God bless you. <laughs>